reaching Israel and the world and the world. Shalom Yedidim. Yedidim is the Hebrew word for friends. Welcome today, beloved ones, to Discovering the Jewish Jesus. Cynthia Marjorie, we're beginning a, a series today called The Lens of Eternity. And this has been really one of those messages that has really shaken me. I mean, sometimes uh, the Lord will put something in me, it's, it's powerful. But this is one of those words that the Lord has given me. It's like, it's one of the deepest words. And what we're focusing on is the fact that so many of us, so many of those that are part of God's kingdom are living for this world. They're living for things that they can obtain in this life. And God is calling us to come to a higher place and recognize it's not about this world. We've been called to live for another age, for the age to come. What's your thought on this? Wow, I love the name of it, the lens. It's, it, we all look through a lens. And what are we looking through? Are we looking through the lens from God's point of view? And, uh, or are we looking from the lens of the world? You know, is it about the glory of this world? Or is it about the glory of God and his kingdom and the eternal? kingdom that we're all going to. So I, I love the beauty of this message. It's going to be really deep, beloved ones, and God is going to rewire your lives. God wants to lift you and I out of looking to be fulfilled by this world, recognizing this world is not our home. Baruch Hashem, beloved ones, bless the name of the Lord. Shalom uvracha, peace and blessings to you as we begin a brand new series today that I'm calling The Lens of Eternity. Father God, I pray that as we hear your word, that you would do a transformational work in our soul. Father, that through the power of your spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and the living word of God, that you would lift us, Abba God, to live in the atmosphere of eternity. And we ask this for your glory, Abba, in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Beloved, the words that I'm going to deliver today in this series, truly, if they cut deep, they will change your outlook. They'll change your attitude. You can be lifted to perceiving life in a whole different way. The Lord's been putting this word in my soul. It's so heavy. I just pray that he'll give me the ability to communicate it to you in such a way that it will transform you into the image of Jesus. The Bible tells us that as Yeshua was in this world, so also now are we. And so in order to be in this world as Yeshua was, we need to think as Yeshua thought. And part of thinking as Yeshua thought is to understand reality not just from the perspective of the here and the now, but to understand our reality from the perspective of the eternal. Now, what does it mean to have an eternal perspective? What does the word eternity mean? It's a word, beloved, that is so deep and so mysterious that we can touch on it, but we cannot fully grasp it until we see them face to face. But we're going to make some progress. I want to begin today by sharing with you something that happened in my own life over 40 years ago. I'm not going to tell you the whole dream encounter, but I'm simply going to say this. I had an encounter with the Lord in my sleep over 40 years ago. And after I had the encounter, I was still in the dream state. But in the dream state, when the weight of the encounter was deep inside me, I literally heard the audible voice of God, not through my ears, but I heard the audible voice of God in my inner man. When I say audible, what I mean is I clearly actually heard his voice. I heard the word. So once again, I'm in a dream state and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing eternity. I didn't call it eternity in the dream state. I just saw it. And then after I saw it and asked the Spirit of the Lord to come and live within me, the Lord spoke to me the word audibly, eternity. And I always wondered about that. The word eternity is not used that much in the Bible. 
The scriptures tell us, for example, that the Lord has put eternity within our hearts. But we don't have a huge amount of literature in the scriptures to help us determine what the word eternal or eternity means. Oftentimes when people think of eternity, they think of eternity as a, uh, uh, they define it in terms of a length of time, that it goes on forever. But eternity is more than simply going on forever. In other words, once again, beloved, a lot of times if I ask somebody, what does eternity mean? They would say it means that it goes on forever. But that is not really a full definition of eternity because eternity exists outside of time. It can't be measured by time. So to say simply that eternity is something that goes on forever falls way short of defining it because eternity not only transcends time, it includes past, present, and future, but eternity is a quality. Jesus, for example, defined eternal when he said, this is eternal life. And obviously now eternity and eternal are related. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that you would know God and Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, whom he has sent. And so Yeshua defined eternity as a state in which we're in union with God. When we're in union with God, when we're living by his life, walking in him, then we are experiencing eternity because God is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He exists outside of time. He exists outside of space. He's altogether different from what we know while living here on earth in these earthly bodies apart from being renewed in our mind. If you and I, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, because we are now born again, if we are going to live in the dimension that we're called to, and that is the dimension of being a citizens of heaven, being in the world, as Yeshua said, but not of the world, we are going to have to begin to get an eternal perspective in such a way that we perceive what is happening in the here and in the now, in the literal circumstances of our life today, in the way that we think and the way that we talk, we're going to have to get a whole new perspective on it. It's going to have to be, beloved, an eternal perspective. And to have an eternal perspective means that our mind is going to be completely rewired. Because before we were brought into this born-again experience, and when I use the word born-again, I know that for a lot of people, that's a term that turns them off. Because some people, when they hear the term born again, they think of some kind of old-time religion that had a certain style and it had a certain culture. And they uh, sometimes think that people that are the born-again types are uneducated. Beloved, let's put all that aside for a second. Let's not allow uh, culture to determine biblical words and what they mean. Jesus himself said, unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He's talking about being born of the Spirit, unless you be born of the Spirit. And so what I'm saying is this, that when we receive Yeshua, those of us that have received him, and there'll be some that are listening today that will receive him for the first time. When you receive him, when you receive Yeshua, you receive the gift of eternal life. You receive the very Spirit of God within you. And through the Spirit that's within you, and the transforming of our mind by the Word of God, the written Word of God, and the Holy Spirit's communication to us, everything changes, our thinking changes, so that we no longer perceive life only by what is going on in the now. But we gain a whole other perspective and come to a real realization that what is happening in the now is very transitory. It is an illusion it's passing away. As the scripture says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord abides forever. We're brought into a new dimension of light so that we can see that what we once responded to because it happened to us right now, we no longer have to respond to it as if it is the only thing that holds any weight because we realize that it is a transitory momentary uh, thing, and we, we, we capture it and put it in our feet because we have the mind of eternity. 
Paul, for example, said this. I'm reading from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. Hear the word of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary, there's that word momentary, for momentary light affliction, so he's talking about the temporary circumstances. He's saying, listen, I'm going through a lot of things in my life. Paul had been imprisoned, he had been beaten, he had been shamed, he had been persecuted, he had been rejected, he had been shipwrecked, he had been uh, lashed, he had been whipped, and I could go on and on and on. See, if he didn't know the Lord, if he didn't have an eternal perspective, he would have saw himself as a victim. But he said, no, I don't see myself as a victim because these are momentary light afflictions. They're passing away, and my identity isn't defined by these momentary light afflictions. My life isn't defined by these momentary light afflictions because I have a, 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 a citizenship in eternity and these momentary light afflictions are actually producing in me an eternal weight of glory. And so the point is, he wasn't captured in time. He wasn't bound by simply interpreting his life by what was happening right now. Rather, he saw what was happening right now, the imprisonment, the beating, the torture, the shame, the rejection, the suffering. He saw all that as a momentary thing that would soon pass him by, and by going through this momentary affliction in faith, there was an eternal weight of glory, glory from another realm, glory from the God zone, if you will, that was being wrought within him. So listen again. He had an eternal perspective. This is what I'm driving at. This is what I'm calling us to. We have to stop interpreting our life just by what is going on now. And believers everywhere right now, they're so focused on this world, trying to be gratified by the world, thinking the now is all there is, that they're missing the boat. Paul said once again, for the momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. In other words, this temporary suffering was, re, was, was imparting something to me far beyond the pain of the light affliction. It's like, for example, this is a very weak illustration, and I hesitate even to use it, but you'll understand the concept. It's like a, a, an, an athlete that has the goal of becoming an Olympic gold medalist. These athletes that are training for the Olympics, they are going through an excruciating training schedule, waking up some of them four o'clock in the morning, training nine hours a day, just, just putting their body through such tremendous, uh, tremendous strain. Their whole body's hurting, their diet is making them sometimes feel weak. It is such a painful ordeal, but they do it because they know that the temporary pain of training and discipline is not worthy to be compared to what it's gonna feel like when they have their hand raised as an Olympic gold medalist. This is how Paul lived his life. Paul lived his life not counting the things that he had to go through that caused him pain to be worthy to be compared to the eternal weight of glory that these things were working in him and the reward that was coming to him when the new age dawns. And you and I, need to start throwing off our worldly mentality, thinking that life consists of grabbing all we can from the world in greediness as if this is all there is, and we need to start getting a heavenly perspective. We need to start living with a view to eternity, recognizing this world is not our home. It was never called to be our home. We're in the world, the scripture says, as strangers and aliens, and we need to start living for the age to come.
People in the United States, sometimes when they hear about uh, you know, witchcraft, it seems so foreign to them. It seems like something that is just for superstitious people. But when you travel the world in places like Africa, Cuba, other nations, it becomes so tangible and so real. It's right in front of your face. And the thing is, is that when these demons manifest, you look in the people's eyes that the demons are manifesting through. And when you look into their eyes, it will remove all doubt as to whether this is really demonic or not. Because you look into the eyes of the people through whom the demons are manifesting, and in the eyes you see pure terror. And it's like their eyes are fixed on another realm. They're transfixed. It's like they're looking at some horror film from outer space. And they're locked on it. And they can't get free from it. They're like totally confused totally terrorized. And then you take authority over those spirits. You command that person in Jesus' name to look into your eyes. And when they look into your eyes, because the eyes are the window to the soul, the demons are forced to face the Spirit of God in me or in the believer, and those demons have to flee. They flee at Jesus' name, and those people are set free. And then what happens is all that terror and all that confusion leaves them. And then the Spirit of the Lord fills them in the beauty of the Creator manifest through them, then tears begin to come and they're free. Beloved, permit me to just come straight out. I want to ask you to become a partner with discovering the Jewish Jesus. John tells us in 3 John chapter 1, verse 8, that the church should support men that are being faithful to the truth and proclaiming God's word. Those of you that tune into this broadcast know that for week after week after week, I've been endeavoring to be faithful to God's Word, to be used to the Lord to build the church and to make His name great in the church and in our lives. Beloved, I simply want to ask you, if you're not already a monthly partner with me in Discovering the Jewish Jesus, would you prayerfully ask the Lord about taking action and becoming one? Let's continue on. Paul said, for a momentary light affliction, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. Listen to what he says next. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Did you get that? Paul is saying, listen, I'm not getting my cues about what is real based on what I see. I am not getting my perception of reality from the visible world because what I see is transitory. It's temporal. The visible world will pass away. The scripture says that everything that we see right now in the visible world, it's going to be burned up. It's going to be burned up in fire. We're going to get to those scriptures. It's going to all be done away with. God is going to bring forth something brand new. And if we're living for this age, if we're living for the things of this world, if we're sowing our heart into that which is temporal, when the world gets burned up, we're going to be destroyed with it. And so we need to lift ourselves up and start asking ourselves, what is it that God wants from, from me as I'm walking in this earth? How can I live in this world as one that understands that he's not of the world? Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But because I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We're not to consider this world our home. The Bible says that Moses, rather than considering himself the son of Pharaoh's daughter and inheriting all of Egypt as a prince, he did away with that because he was looking for a city whose builder and architect was God. He was looking for a heavenly city. He had everything that the world could offer, but for him, that was not what life was about. It was looking for the eternal inheritance that came from his creator that was not of this world. Now, as I'm speaking, I know that for some of you, my words are rolling off your back a bit like water off a duck's back. You intellectually agree with what I'm saying. Well, let me challenge you, my friend. It's not enough to intellectually agree with what I'm saying. I want to know how what I'm saying is affecting your life. How is eternity and your faith in eternity affecting the way you live today? 
Are you living in a bubble? Are you just living to protect yourself and your family, to enjoy yourself? You have God over here on the side as a little compartment of your life. You feel like you're a good person because you go to church. That's not what we're talking about, my friends. We're talking about a radical rewiring so that we are consciously living every day with the awareness of eternity, that we are in this world and that this world is not our home, that we belong to God that the purpose of our life is bound up in him, that every day is a day that we're to be overcoming. What do I mean by overcoming? I'm talking about, first of all, personal transformation, that every day we're to be engaged with the powers of darkness, warfaring against them to personally transcend so that we overcome our old nature, overcome the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, so that we overcome personally and more and more have a mind that's been transformed and renewed in the power of the age to come, and we're in the world to be able to bring forth his light as a witness to others. But how can you and I bring forth the reality of eternity and the age to come to others if we're not captured by it ourselves? If we've not been impregnated with the spirit of eternity, by bringing eternity into our now, how are we going to impact those around us with the reality of Jesus' second coming and the age to come? Beloved, listen, I want to warn us today. Many of us are saying, yeah, yeah, I got it. But you know what? You don't have it. You look at your life. How are you living? How are you talking? What are you doing with your money? What are you doing with your talents? How much time are you giving to the Lord so that you could be personally transformed? How much time are we sitting before him? How much time are we reading Christian literature? It's important to read Christian literature. When John had the vision that uh, was now in our scriptures, which is now in our scriptures called the book of Revelation, when the angel revealed to John the words that are in the book of John, uh, uh, Revelation, the word of the Lord came to John and said, write, write. In other words, the Lord said to John, write these words that I'm giving to you. God has always communicated with his people through sacred writings. So my point again is this. It's not enough to say, yeah, I believe. My question is, how has it changed and affected and impacted the way that you're living? How does it impact the way that you relate to your husband, wife, your friends, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors? How has it radically changed your lifestyles? How has it affected your priorities? What is first in your life? If you're the real deal, you should be getting some persecution and some kickback from the world. Because Jesus said, all that desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why? Because those that are living by the power of the age to come, by the power of eternity, are in a radically different trajectory than those that are living by the power of the present age. Beloved, I want you to get this into your soul. We're going to continue in this series, and we're going to be here as long as we need to, to get totally transformed and rewired so it becomes evident to everyone around us, most importantly to God himself, that we are not of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and we are living, beloved one, by the powers of the age to come as we wait for the glory of Yeshua to be revealed. Thank you for tuning in today. Beloved, I've been praying that Father God would continue to subject me and that I would cooperate with his subjection and come under the blade of his word. The word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And it's ministered to us in the power of the Holy Spirit through Messiah Jesus. In order for this process to take place, I have to be willing to come under his authority. And when we come under his authority, it affects our disciplining of our thoughts, our attitude, our words, everything in life, including how we use our finances. I want to encourage you, Surrender your finances to God, to Hashem, because we can't enter into the fullness of His presence without being surrendered to Him in every area of our lives. If the Lord is blessing you and feeding you through this ministry, and you feel Him urging you to make a donation to Him through it, beloved, just be obedient.
Here's how you can donate or become a monthly partner. Send your tax-deductible gift to Discovering the Jewish Jesus, P.O. Box 777, Blissfield, Michigan, 49228. Or to give by credit card, visit discoveringthejewishjesus.com or call 1-800-777-7835 or text the keyword rabbi to 45777. To show our appreciation, we'll send you an audio CD and download of Rabbi's Message of the Month and our most recent newsletter. Your gift is bringing salvation, healing, and deliverance to Israel and the world through television, internet, and crusade outreaches. Finally, many of us have honored God with our finances while living, but have we considered how we can honor the Lord with our finances when we pass on? For more information, click Will and Estate Gifts at discoveringthejewishjesus.com. In the book of Numbers, chapter 6, the Lord gave instructions to Moses and Aaron to speak this blessing over his people. And the Lord said, when you speak these words over my people, I will place my name on them and bless them. Receive the impartation of the Lord's blessings. Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift you up by his countenance and the Lord give you, beloved one, his peace. God bless you and shalom. Revelation today for a brighter tomorrow. Find Discovering the Jewish Jesus on all your favorite social media outlets and stay up to date on the content you love. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe on YouTube. Connecting with Discovering the Jewish Jesus has never been easier. If two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Let our prayer team pray for you. Send us your prayer request today by visiting our website or writing to the address on the screen. Our prayer team lifts up every individual request before the Lord. And then, as God answers your prayer request, or if God has touched your life through discovering the Jewish Jesus, send us your testimony. We want to rejoice with you, and your testimony will encourage others. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Next time on Discovering the Jewish Jesus, God is calling you to a higher dimension. Join Rabbi as he continues to teach on how to grow out of living in the now and grow into the realm of the eternal.